Ladies and gentlemen, this Red Gaming Ted.com video, we have some more news on the Xbox One. This time concerning a memory bandwidth from the ESRAM that is, of course, embedded onto the APU. Previously, Microsoft have said that the actual bandwidth of the ESRAM would be about 102 gigabytes per second. However, now there has been new uh, information that actually tells us that Microsoft have been revising this and have actually been telling the developers that no, this is no longer true and it's actually 192 gigabytes per second. This is all theoretical, by the way, this is not actual. So what exactly is this ESRAM? Well, we've spoken about this before and it's 32 megabytes of memory that's embedded directly on to the Xbox One's processor. The purpose behind this was because the Xbox One, of course, is using eight gigabytes of DDR3 memory, which is significantly slower than the PlayStation 4's GDDR5. Now, the GDDR5 on the PS4 actually gives about 176 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth. So the question you've got to ask yourself is, how the heck can there be the massive discrepancy? It's not just, you know, a few gigabytes per second difference. It's not like 102 versus 110, where you could be like, oh, oopsie daisy, and it's a slight miscalculation. How the hell can there be 102 versus 192? Well, it actually turns out that they were doing basic math um, when they were calculating this. They took 128 bytes per block and multiplied that by the GPU's clock speed, which is 800 megahertz, and that gave us the throughput of 102.4. However, this was taken with the assumption that you can read and write from the memory on a separate actions. So in other words, you have to read, wait, then write once the read has finished. However, Microsoft have now been experimenting with the final production silicon. Now, this is the important part. In other words, beforehand, they were messing about with silicon that hadn't been finished. It was basically pre-production stuff. And of course, sometimes either yields improve or something else can happen. And in this case, they've actually found out that the, um, the actual ESRAM is capable of reading and writing simultaneously. Um, basically, there were some spare processing cycle holes, and that can actually be used for these additional operations. Now, as anyone that knows, theory and practice are two different things. For example, if you guys go on Google and you Google people who have fallen from mountains and airplanes then yeah, you could theoretically survive falling from an aeroplane or aeroplane crash, right? There have been mostly women, mostly due to their body weight and so forth being lower, but there have been incidents where women and men as well have fallen from ridiculous heights and actually survived with injuries, sure, but they've lived. But are you going to test it? I certainly wouldn't. In other words, theory and practice are two different things. And in this case, it's most likely that theoretical peak bat performance is not going to echo what's in reality. Now, of course, this is the same for pretty much anything. Developers are really, or should I say console developers or hardware developers are really happy to point out the theoretical stuff because it's always going to be significantly higher than reality. But still, the ESRAM itself apparently still has 133 gigabytes per second throughput, and that's if you're using uh, FP16 times 4. That basically means that you're using alpha transparency blending as well. However, those of you who remember just a couple of weeks ago, I released some rumors that were talking about clock speeds of the Xbox One. Now, from what we understood, the ESRAM of the Xbox One, as well as the clock speed of the Xbox One, were something that Microsoft were having problems with. The ESRAM apparently was having yield issues. In other words, they were having difficulty manufacturing them, especially in decent quantities, because the manufacturing process was basically complicated, and therefore a lot of the, the dyes, a lot of the silicon was basically useless. It wasn't running either to the specifications, so it just wasn't working at all. We didn't have exactly... Um, the information on this. For example, a lot of the time, if you have a GPU, for example, um, and it doesn't quite hit the speed bins that, um, say, for example, of 
the 1000 series, just a pure example, um, they may later on produce another series, say the, the 800 series, just an example once again, and that would use the parts that didn't quite make the speed bin for the 1000 series. Now in this case, the yields were just bad, and uh, we don't exactly know what the issue was because they're rumours, uh, but those rumours also pointed out that, sorry guys, that's my phone deciding to um, troll me, um, at the same time, the actual GPU clock speeds of the uh, Xbox One's uh, uh, APU, of course, that's an amalgamation of both the GPU and CPU together, supposedly that was having overheating issues. In other words, it was putting out a lot more heat than the cooling system was comfortable to remove. And therefore, Microsoft was apparently downclocking or underclocking, if you will, the GPU. Um, the exact amount of that was open to uh, a little bit of debate but it was anything between 1 to 200 megahertz which could mean that it was going from the si from the 800 megahertz which of course is what we believe the GPU is actually running at to 600 megahertz however this basically stomps that in the face because of course they are now telling developers well you know it was based upon the math of 800 times x so that means that in theory at least the Xbox One's GPU does actually mean that it is running at 800 megahertz. Secondly, it appears from other rumors that the CPU is actually running on exactly the same speed as the PS4's. That would mean it would be running at um, 1.6 gigahertz. Now, we're going to also talk about the Xbox One's performance in titles. Now, I actually got a few messages of this, but I wanted to wait until there were more information on it because it would basically have been pure speculation on my part. And sure, I don't mind speculating as long as there's something there to speculate on. However, many people had pointed out the titles such as Rise, which of course is produced by Crytek, they'd pointed out that the frame rate on that game was pretty abysmal, which is something that's a bit odd because as it turns out, the PS4 titles were running at 30 frames per second at 1080p, although a lot of the titles on the Xbox One were running at 60 frames per second at 1080p. However, on the Xbox side of things, there was some stuttering in terms of frame rate, as well as the graphics sometimes looked a little bit shoddier. Um, what it basically many people were assuming is that Sony just said to developers, balls to it, just go all out, just make it look as good as possible. Xbox, on the other hand, wanted more smooth gameplay. So, of course, as I said, there have been some performance issues. Now, what it appears is that um, from various sources and just how reliable this stuff is, you're going to have to take with a pinch of salt. I wouldn't be surprised if it was fairly accurate, however, we'll go into the why in a moment. But it appears that Microsoft have basically implemented all of the feature set. So all of that's in. However, they're still optimizing the operating system and the drivers. Now, bear in mind that the Xbox One's uh, OS systems and the way they work is actually quite complicated. It is not just a singular OS. It's actually three. And so when you consider that if you were to look at, say, PC performance of graphics cards, a little bit after launch, you'll notice that well, driver upgrades do significantly, and by significantly, we're talking anything from 10% to 40%, depending upon the title, do significantly improve the actual performance of the game. So it's likely that it's going to be very, very, to very hard to ascertain what the, the performance differential is between the Xbox One and the PS4. However... That isn't to say that there isn't going to be a performance difference between the Xbox One and the PS4. There is noticeable differences on the two pieces of hardware. Now, many analysts um, are already assuming that the Xbox One is going to be outputting at either a lower resolution, lower quality, generally lower frame rate or something. Why? Because, quite simply put, it has less GPU grunt. There's no getting around that. Now, Okay, there is the cloud, and we've spoken about this heavily before, but in some games, it just isn't going to do you any good at all. It's that simple. Plus, since we know now that some developers, or so, sorry, now we know that the Xbox One isn't going to have always online, developers are going to have to make the assumption of, do we design a game with the cloud in mind? 
Now, another point is even if they have cloud-based uh, computing, in some tasks it just doesn't help. Now, the PS4 could well have cloud as well. It's really up in the air, and Sony are not really talking about it right now. However, let's ignore the GPU side of things and focus on the memory for a moment. Now, one of the things that developers requested heavily and you guys can check out a previous video I did on this I believe it was yesterday um, talking about Mark Cerny now Mark Cerny is one of the leading developers he actually art was the leading architect on the PS4 and he conducted a survey and the survey basically said um, what do you want on the new next generation hardware and developers basically said well for consoles we would really appreciate UMA unified memory unified memory access if you want the full version and he actually said that they could have gone with embedded RAM, pretty much taken the approach of GDD of 5 RAM and then they added in ES RAM or something equivalent to give even more memory bandwidth. However, they decided that this wasn't really the approach they went, wanted to go with because as it turns out, if they were to do that, it a, increased, increased the complexity of the production of the console which of course therefore increases the price but more to the point it also starts to impede or at least add extra concern for developers on what the hell they are going to do. Now it doesn't take a mathematical genius of any you know great degree to start looking at titles on the PC and start looking at that those titles are gargantuan when it comes to texture requirements right so if you've got a one gigabyte graphics card now if assuming you're playing at 1080p most titles will be okay uh, especially on a medium to high settings but if you want to turn all the eye candy on this is especially true of games such as like crisis one gig is probably not going to do you any service um, a lot of this of course depends on other stuff such as what games you're playing um, levels of anti-aliasing and stropic filtering and various other bits and pieces um, but generally speaking one gigabyte is just not going to do you any good for a lot of modern titles now this is further illustrated by the post-mortem document that was released by Gorilla now Gorilla of course are producing a kill zone shadow fall for the PS4 for the PlayStation 4 I'm sorry I've got a bit of hay fever so my voice goes a little bit funny occasionally as my nose decides to troll me um, what was I going to say? Oh yes, and in that document, and I have done an analysis video as, of that as well as the lighting document that they produced, and you can also go ahead and check out the articles on RGT if you want a more in-depth breakdown of this stuff. But as it turns out, their textures and everything else are gigantuan with um, Killzone. I'm talking massive, we're talking like 3 gigs total um, and the render targets are something around 800 megabytes maybe 900 megabytes, I don't exactly remember um, it's from memory but I know it's pretty darn high so many are already saying to ourselves well okay you've got 32 megabytes of fast embedded memory that's real nice but what happens when you want to start using things that are like, you know, 1 gig, 2 gig, 3 gigs? Does 32 megabytes compared to 8 gigabytes, that is a huge discrepancy. And as I said, it doesn't take a mathematical genius to even figure that even if you were to times that by 10, that's only 320 megabytes, which is far less than 1 gig. Now, there have been some debate on this, and... I've spoken about this heavily before, so you can check out some previous Xbox One videos if you want in more in-depth analysis. You can probably type in ESRAM or something on the channel and tons of stuff will come up. But one theory behind this is that a lot of games code now is repetitive. In other words, that the basic purpose of that code is just to tell you, okay, when you need to go. It's almost like the equivalent of, let's use the example of walking. Your brain is basically recycling the same information of put one foot forward, one foot forward, the other foot forward, the other foot forward. But in reality, you're not really thinking about it. Instead, you're thinking, okay, what direction do I have to go? So in actuality, you don't really need to think how to walk now because it's, well, natural. So in other words, your brain is just referencing something you've already done before. So in this case, the theory, and this is obviously not exactly a completely accurate analogy, but it's just to get it out there for people who are not really sure about this stuff. 
for those of you who are, you probably know about stuff anyway. But the theory behind it is that a lot of the common operations um, and so forth, they can be put on the ESRAM. The ESRAM primarily, and I emphasize the word primarily, will be used for GPU functionality because that is what generally speaking, will hoover up a lot of the bandwidth. That isn't to say that the APU, the CPU side of things anyway, cannot access this. It can, which is great for times that it needs to change a bit of code in there before, say, the GPU has access to it. But generally speaking, it will be primarily reserved for the GPU. So does that mean that the Xbox One in that respect is doomed? Well, there are a few caveats here. There are always caveats. First of all, there is what is known as Scalable Hardware Audio Processing Engine. You can also call it Shape if you want to be its best buddy in the world. And that's actually a custom audio hardware from the Xbox One. Now, it's very important to note that this is very a very powerful audio hardware and while you may be happy to dismiss audio hardware while you may be happy to say oh it's only audio who the bollocks cares it's worth noting that when you start adding in things such as hd surround sound they vacuum up a lot of cpu time and so we're not really sure how the PlayStation 4 compares with that. There hasn't been an exact answer that as far as I'm aware. If there is information, please link it in the video below. Or you can attack me on Facebook by going to facebook.com slash redgamingtech and you can message me or leave it on the wall or whatever you so desire. And that's probably better if you expect an answer because I have so many comments coming in. It's really difficult to keep up with everything. That is not me blanking on you that is not me being mean or whatever that is simply the fact that i'm extremely busy because i'm working and doing rgt and trying to do website move and everything else so if you're trying to contact me urgently as i've said before regular viewers know this just go to facebook.com slash red gaming tech and i have a message or put it on the wall whatever and you can address it to paul or crimson rain that's me and that will get to us the reason i point that out is because there are a couple of us working on rgt there's actually about four of us um, who access, have access to the Facebook account. Anyway, um, so Shape is going to be really powerful and will take a lot of the CPU rendering time, or should I say encoding time, off of the, um, the, what, the worry of the Xbox. So we're not really sure how the PS4 deals with that. Of course, both CPUs are going to be using the AMD Jaguar. Both CPUs are supposedly running at 1.6 gigahertz. Furthermore, both are going to have eight cores. So... One, hard thread, one hardware thread each, of course. Secondly, there is a little bit of other clemency. We know from rumours and reports and analyses and goodness knows what else that the PS4's CPU does not have full access to the GDDR5 bandwidth of the memory. I've heard a couple of conflicting reports. Anything from around the low 20 gigabytes per second all the way up to about 30 gigabytes per second. However, it's not really surprising. Memory bandwidth on the CPU. Remember the CPU on both the Xbox One and the PS4 are not exactly amazing. I've done further analyses of this if you prefer to look at those. You can just either go to redgamingtech.com and our articles there or you can check out the YouTube channel and you can just type in AMD Jaguar and there are some comparisons to desktop CPUs and there's a lot of information there as well. But basically, even desktop CPUs, we're talking like the really high-end ones, are using DDR3 uh, DDR memory. And so memory bandwidth of the AMD Jaguar is not going to really be a requirement. Therefore, one may argue that in some scenarios, the Xbox One could actually be slightly ahead because a DDR3 memory actually has a lower latency than a GDDR5. Now, that isn't necessarily to say that it will work like that. It is just a little bit of a, a, little bit of a caveat and something to think on. Now, on paper, the PS4, Sony have an advantage. But, if you were to look at E3, it's very difficult to say, well, the Xbox One blatantly only has 1.2 GHz and the PS4 blatantly has significantly more computing power, uh, 1.84, and that's the end of it. 
it wasn't really like that. The Xbox One actually in some ways was more stable in terms of frame rate, but the PS4, as I said, looked slightly better in certain games. But it was all much about muchness. It wasn't really that obvious, and it's also really just blatant to anyone that a lot of this stuff is still unfinished. In other words, it is not... Uh, been even used on final hardware after all that's what most of this video is about the fact that Microsoft just realized oh actually by the way um, this ES RAM actually performs better than what we you know expected ha 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 you can almost expect them to do some cackling it must be really nice for them to actually find something going right for them for once um, and so it's going to be really difficult to see what happens now in theory and once again, this is theoretical stuff. The PS3 and Xbox 360, and it was the previous generation, obviously, have about 240 uh, G-flops of computing power apiece. So let's just round up and say 500. Theoretically, the Xbox One, the PS3, and the P uh, Xbox 360 all combined have actually less computing power than the PS4. In reality, whether that's going to play out, whether we're actually going to see that on reality, when it actually comes on screen, it's unknown, because there are dozens of different issues. For example, sure, the GDDR5 memory does have 176 gigabytes per second. However, Gorilla have already said that you still need to be very efficient with the read and write operations, because it is not this unlimited well where everyone can drink from. It is not infinite. There are boundaries. And so we're going to see if... The PlayStation 4 does have some issues there. Furthermore, the DDR3 memory in terms of low latency access could well be a very good thing. So, once again, this is not concrete evidence of anything. This is evidence that, on paper, the PS4 definitely wins in terms of how easy it is to develop for. And secondly, how... Well... Let's just be honest how much GPU power it has, but whether in reality, especially when we start to take into account, for example, let's assume that Xbox One has better audio hardware, let's assume that the DDR3 memory latency is going to be a big issue, and let's also assume that cloud-based gaming is going to be reasonable, and let's assume that the PS4 doesn't do that just for a moment, and once again, these are all assumptions. It's going to be very hard to call this stuff, and it's also going to be very very interesting to see how developers themselves are going to optimize the hardware. Or should I say their titles on the hardware. Anyway, this has been a fairly lengthy video, but I think a quite an interesting one. So anyway, I'm going to leave that right here. Hopefully you've enjoyed it. I will see you soon. Take care, and bye for now.